Chodesh Tov. Okay, so today is Rosh Chodesh Tammuz, and uh, you know there are stories and certain ideas. If you want to go deeper, maybe even certain aspects of divine light that are associated with different times of year. Like, for example, when we talk about um, Tuba Nisan, right, the fifteenth of Nisan. There is a unique light that shines into our world on the 15th of Nisan. Um, it's what we call the light of Cherut, the light of freedom. Now, this light doesn't shine into our world because we left Egypt on the 15th of Nisan. We left Egypt on the 15th of Nisan because this light was already shining into the world. Right? We learned that Avraham Avinu, Avraham, Abraham, ate matzot on Pesach. You guys heard this before? that Avraham ate matzot on Pesach. He ate matzah on Pesach. So why would Avraham eat matzah on Pesach if matzah was simply something we eat to remember leaving Egypt? Hashem writes history. Right? And um, things tend to work out. Things t- tend to make sense. So, for whatever, reading, for whatever reason, eating matzot on the 15th of Nisan helps us to access and fully experience the unique light of freedom that shines into our world on the 15th of Nisan. And that was the case even before we left Egypt. Now, it happened to be that there was like an historical occurrence that caused us to have to leave quickly and the bread didn't rise and we ended up with matzah and so now we eat matzah. But there was a value to eating the matzot before that anecdote came to be. Right? That anecdote came to be. It so happened that Hashem wrote history in such a way that we have to, have to leave in a hurry and the bread wouldn't rise. So that there would be like a, a tangible reason, a reason we could understand why we eat matzot on Pesach. But the real reason for eating matzot on Pesach is because it's one of the rituals that we engage in to fully experience the unique divine light that shines into our world on that day of the year, the light of freedom. And the Maharal, if you learn uh, Gvrot Hashem, which is the Maharal of Prague's book on, uh, on, Pesach, on the Yitzhak Mitzrayim, on Pesach, you'll see he explains the deep differences between chametz and matzah. That, that there's like a real deep significance and there's a value to matzah. And there's a barrier that chametz creates that prevents us from fully experiencing what we're supposed to be experiencing on Pesach. Also, it should be noted that when this light of Cherut shines into our world, the, fifth, the leaving of Egypt, the exodus from Egypt, is not the only example of historical occurrences that took place on this day. Anybody here studied Josephus? The works of Josephus? Well, it's important this time of year to study Josephus. Maybe we'll dedicate the next few classes to some of the, uh, the ideas surrounding our great revolt against Rome. But uh, according to Josephus, the Sicarii, uh, the freedom fighters at Masada, took their own lives rather than become slaves to Rome on the 15th of Nisan. That it was actually on Leil Seder, it was actually on Seder night that the Sikari, under the command of Elazar ben Yair, took their own lives rather than become slaves and prostitutes and gladiators of the Romans. So that's another example of us accessing this light or us being enabled to do amazing things as a result of this light shining into the world. Meaning it could be that any other day of the year those fighters would not have had the inner strength to do what they did. I mean, it's not easy, right? They all killed their families and themselves. It's a hard thing to do. Could be that most days of the year that would have been impossible for them. But on this night, when the light of freedom was shining into our world, they were able to do it. Also, uh, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising to begin on the 15th of Nisan. We ended up, you know, the reason why we have Yom HaZikaron L'Shoah V'Lagvura, you write the Memorial Day for the Holocaust and the heroism, on, we have it a couple weeks later, 
right? The end of Nisan, but it was moved. The reason why we have it at that time of year is because of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. For those who don't know, what we now just call Yom HaShoah was not originally established to commemorate the victims of the Holocaust. We have other days for that. On a national level, we have Tisha B'Av. On a personal level, in terms of people you know, who had lost loved ones but didn't know what date they were taken, we have the Tent of Tevet. Right? The Tent of Tevet essentially became like the, uh, the yurt site for all of the victims of the Shoah that, whose yurt sites we don't know. And on a national level, Tisha B'Av, the 9th of Av, that we remember not just that catastrophe, but uh, pretty much all of the catastrophes. But understanding the Holocaust as merely a tolda, you guys know what a tolda is? Like there's an av and a tolda, right? Like a, to- a derivative of a primary injustice that took place when the Romans destroyed our civilization in Jerusalem and, and uh, exiled us from our land. That if not for that, you know, the Inquisition, the Holocaust, the pogroms, none of that would have taken place because they're all the results, they're all the derivatives of a primary injustice inflicted upon us by Rome. But Yom HaShoah was not meant to be a sad day. Yom HaShoah was not meant to be a day where we merely uh, remember victims of the Holocaust. Yom HaShoah is a day to remember Remember, it's in Nisan. You can't have sad days in the month of Nisan. It's a day to commemorate that in the midst of all that evil, some of us actually managed to make some Germans bleed. That's Yom HaShoah. That we remember those who fought back physically. I know that there is now, we've expanded the definition of heroism and we've expanded the definition of what it means to fight back and there's truth to that. There are definitely other forms of heroism besides physical violence. But in a situation where there was an entire machine working to strip us of our humanity and part of how this functioned was that each of us were uh, forced into situations where we were in uh, like hyper survival mode. Just, you know, the individual and maybe our families. Like just how to get through another day, another day, another day. Focus on individual survival. That's the position we were put in. And when a whole people is, is put into a position like that and reduced to something less than human, to actually be willing to resort to violence, to fight the Nazis, to be willing to put ourselves individually at risk, in harm's way, in order to create a better situation for the collective, that's already a deep, deep, deep expression of humanity. It's not just violence. It's a case in which violence becomes an expression of very, very deep humanity and love. So that's why I remember Yom HaShoah. But it really is from the light of Cherut, from the light of uh, the 15th of Nisan. So now we're entering the month of Tammuz. And there is a unique story associated with Tammuz. And uh, Tammuz and Av, right? Because when you get to the 17th of Tammuz, we start a three-week period. You know, we, we fast and we mourn. We've been doing so for thousands of years on the 17th of Tammuz. All over the world, Jews everywhere. For thousands of years, have afflicted ourselves, mourned, fasted on the 17th of Tammuz. Why? Because the Romans broke through the walls of Jerusalem. Interesting. That means for anybody here who has ever walked from Shar Yafo, from the Jaffa Gate, to, let's say the Kotel or Harabait. That's a walk that takes what? 20 minutes? Half hour tops? Mm, depends on you. Okay. Could you imagine it taking three weeks? Could you imagine, you know, the bitter fighting every inch that the Roman military 
one of the greatest militaries in the world at the time. The bitter fighting each step towards the Temple Mount that it took them three weeks to get there. What they had to cut their way through. The resistance we put up. So we're entering this time of year where this is a story that we need to tell ourselves. This is a story we need to educate ourselves about. And it's a story we don't know for the most part. It's not a story that many of us are very familiar with. I mean, they're, they're great personalities associated with this story. I think personalities that have what to teach us um, for good and for bad. Starting with Josephus. I mean, he's not a simple guy. Josephus Flavius, Yosef ben Matityahu would be his name in uh, Hebrew. Mo- Yosef ben Matityahu HaKohen, who um, is a complicated man. Uh, very complicated. Uh, it's also, but if you can learn his writings, especially pertaining to that war, you grow the ability, you develop the ability to really filter the biases of any news network. You know, you can, because I used to teach a class on Josephus, I feel comfortable getting my news anywhere. I can go to Arucheva, I can go to Haaretz, I can go to Al Jazeera, I can go to 972, I can go to, uh, even on, you know, in the rest of the world, like other, doesn't matter. I can, like I'm already like conditioned to filter biases. And I think I picked that up from teaching Josephus. Because in order to fully understand the story he's telling us, we have to be able to filter his biases. Which is okay, because the truth is every educator has biases. If you ever meet an educator who claims to, uh, to, cl- claims to not be biased, then he's either a liar or he's just not very engaged and probably not very good at teaching a subject. Right? Any good teacher is going to be a biased teacher because he's emotionally connected to what he's teaching. He's committed to what he's teaching. He has a position. He has maybe even skin in the game. So what I appreciate is, is less teachers who claim to be unbiased and more teachers who are just very open about their biases. That's what I try to do. You know, when I teach, I try to be very open about my biases so people know where I'm coming from. And, and I find that to be much more productive than uh, pretending not to have any biases. So this war we're going to learn about is a war that, believe it or not, even though we're, we're like 20 centuries later, um, is still very raw for us. It's still very painful for us, still very difficult for us to confront. Uh, it's maybe one of the reasons why we're so unfamiliar with this story. I mean, how many people in this room can name the rebel leaders of the Jewish forces that fought the Romans? I said one already, Elazar ben Yair, but uh, there's so many more. And if, you know, and, and to be honest, the... You know, what happened at Masada is maybe more of a, an epilogue than a central part of the story. It's a very inspiring epilogue, but still, it's not, you know, it doesn't cover what happened in Jerusalem, what happened in the Galil, and what had been happening really for an entire century uh, since the end of the Herodian dynasty that led to this revolt. What were the Hashkafic differences? What were the philosophical differences between the Zealot movement and the Pharisees? And maybe the more relevant question to us here in Machon Meir, are we the Pharisees or are we the Zealots? And if we're the Zealots, is that a bad thing? But these are questions we need to really ask and explore. And it begins maybe with just understanding what the philosophical differences were between all these sects that existed 2,000 years ago here in Judea. According to Josephus, there is only one major difference between the Pharisee movement and the Zealot movement. And when I say Zealot movement, I'm not talking about the organization called the Zealots. That's a, uh, very confusing because you actually have like a kind of political party slash guerrilla movement called the Zealots, Hakanaim, which were mostly Kohanim from the lower classes, led by Elazar ben Shimon, and then later by Yochanan Mikush Chalav. But... That's one faction. That's part of a broader movement, like ideological movement, called the Zealots. 
right? So you have the Zealot party inside the Zealot movement. But within the Zealot movement, you have the Sikari also, which are like the ideological purists, the ones who took Masada, the ones with a leadership that are direct descendants, right? Like, uh, like think of, you know, like Hasidic dynasties. Rabbi Yudaha Glili, from the Golan Heights, who starts the Zealot movement. The Zealot movement? So the Zealot movement, according to Josephus, was essentially identical to the Pharisee movement. And the Pharisee movement is what we broadly consider to be like the Torah Jews, like, like the rabbis. But that's not 100% accurate. Some of the rabbis at that time, and, we're, and I said, I'm using the word rabbi intentionally. What we call rabbi today aren't real rabbis. Like if you open up a Talmud, what, what we have today is Rav. Right? There's Rabbi and Rav when you, when you look at a Gemara. Rabbi is a, a Zatana and Rav is an Amor, right? So what's the difference between a Rabbi and a Rav? A Rabbi has smicha going back to Moshe Rabbeinu. He's part of that chain from Har Sinai down, right? He can sentence people to death. A rabbi. Rav is a teacher. That's most of what, I mean, there's a, without getting into the conversation of uh, the attempt to revive smicha, real smicha, a few years ago, let's assume that what we have for the most part today is <coughs> Rav. But when we're talking about the first century here in Judea, we're talking about rabbi. We're talking about rabbis who are direct lines, right? They're part of the same chain from Moshe to Yoshua, Yoshua to the elders, etc. Right? They have this like unbroken smicha. Um, you know, we say that we don't record the name of uh, that. No one's name is recorded in in the Gemara who didn't have the ability to raise the dead. I mean, it's not just like rabbi, you know, what we think, you know, teachers today. So I met people who were giants, 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 who, I don't know if they raised the dead, but, you know, but the ability, meaning they were on, you know, whatever we could imagine, a giant mikubal, who, you know, way beyond that. And um, so some were what we'll call Pharisees and some were what we'll call zealots. Most of Beit Shammai, you know, there's Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai, like those are the two major schools, the two major like rabbinical schools at the time. Most of uh, Beit Shammai were in the Zealot movement, whereas a lot of Beit Hillel were in the Pharisee movement. Josephus says that the major difference between them was that the Zealot movement held that we have a Torah obligation to liberate our homeland from Roman rule, because Hashem's oneness cannot be expressed in the world and experienced by humanity unless our homeland is free, unless we have self-determination in our land, unless we have political independence in our land and the ability to create our own civilization that will be a light unto nations. And they derive all this from the Pasuk, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. That our mission in history is to reveal the oneness of the Creator, that in Od Milvado, there's nothing outside of Him, there is only this timeless ultimate reality without end that creates all, sustains all, empowers all, and loves all, and that uh, this is revealed to mankind through the story of human history, and the main characters of that story are the children of Israel. And it's through the story of our people that all of humanity comes to this awareness of the infinite whole that we're all a part of. And therefore our land has to be free. And we can't tolerate, it's, it's actually an avera, it's a sin, it's a transgression to allow Roman rule over our homeland. And we have an obligation to fight until our land is free. That was the only major difference between the zealots and the Pharisees. The Pharisees didn't disagree with it as an ideal. They just weren't sure it was the right time. Whereas from the zealot perspective, it's always the right time. Anyway, so we'll pick this up as Rat Hashem next week. Chodesh Tov.